He's a lot taller up here than it looks. <laughs> <clears throat> it's nice to know that on the how Larry remembers how the church was started, although Adam might get a little offended since we have the same birthday, but he remembers it gives him my birthday. <laughs> uh, if you would turn with me this morning to Luke in chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> thank you all for the opportunity when you turn on and say that. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to come this morning and, and preach for you. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering him said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go thou, and do likewise. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come before you and ask for your help, dear Lord, to, that you would give me the words that I need to speak, dear Lord, and that you would uh, help those here, dear Lord, not because of me, but because of who you are, and that you would prepare their hearts and, and my heart, dear Lord, to receive the message that, that you've given me. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So, I I guess we had to have a title of this, this uh, message. It would be called Being Neighborly. Hmm. Something, of course, in the South we always pride ourselves on, right? Southern hospitality. But how does that relate to what the Bible says? And how do we be biblically neighborly and not just Southern neighborly? In, in, this, in this account here, we see that there was a lawyer. And this is not the first time that Jesus said it had come across the lawyer. Jesus, this happened several times. And these aren't the lawyers that we would think of, people who were versed in just uh, civil law, if you will, criminal law. This was a man who was versed in the Mosaic law, which is why he was called a lawyer, mm -hmm. which for them at that time was the criminal and civil law. It was exclusively, all laws were pretty much on the Bible until the Romans took over. Right. So he was and wasn't a lawyer in the sense that we think of him. But for this, we're going to think about him as a lawyer in in the fact that he was versed in the Mosaic Law. He was, he was a man learned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. He knew all the ins and outs, and I'm sure the loopholes that they found because he was a lawyer. And so he asked Jesus one of those tricky questions. And just what, and what Jesus did was what Jesus does every time. Jesus was asked a slippery question or tempted to the devil. He pointed at the Bible. Amen. And he said, well, what thinkest thou? What does the Bible say? And the man told him. And, and uh, of course, Jesus was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the man answered his own question. So the man thought to justify himself. He had to come back with something. <coughs> Sounds a lot like me when I'm in an argument with somebody, discussing something back and forth, and they hit me. I mean, you have to come back with something. So they come back with Jesus, and he said, well, then, who is my neighbor? Hmm. And on the surface, this may not seem like too much of a trick question, but the Jews had a belief about who your neighbor was. Right. To the Jews, your neighbor was who not just, it wasn't really who you lived beside, but it was those who believed exactly like you did. It was other Jews that believed in the same way that you did. So, and we see another scripture that if you just do good to those that do good to you, what's the point? And even the even the sin, and even sinners do that. And that, that's kind of the question he was asking here to Jesus was, well, who's my neighbor? 
And so Jesus told him a parable. <clears throat> and we're going to look at this parable this morning. The Lord allowed this kind of a an allegory for the Christian walk. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to take it kind of verse by verse and, and break it apart. But um, in, verse, uh, it, in the verse here, uh, whenever he asks, uh, Master, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? I, I looked that word life up just to see, because there's a couple of different words for that in, in the Greek. And this particular word uh, means to, en to enjoy real life. That is to have true life and worthy of the name, active, blessed, endless in the kingdom of God. So he is talking about salvation here, not just um, the life that we, we have here on earth. So in verse 29, uh, he asked Jesus who his neighbor was. And Jesus answered him, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Right. Now, if we, if we keep in mind that, you know, look at this through the lens of an allegory, we see this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem at that time was the religious place. That was where you went to worship. It's where the temple was. So if we think of Jerusalem as the church or as a, a holy place, this man is leaving that. Mm -hmm. And we can think of that in two different ways. I, I couldn't you know, really pinpoint exactly what I thought it was, but you can look at it in the fact that this man was had just left church and was going out to the world. So in, in our sense, it was Monday. Mm -hmm. He went back to work. He went back to life. You know, waiting to get to Wednesday. Or you can look at it in the fact that maybe this gentleman had kind of started to slip away from the church, backslid as we call it. Mm -hmm. Either way, the man is, is leaving church. And for us, let's just say that this man had just, it was Monday for this gentleman. And he had left the church and he left and it said that he fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him. The world hurt this man. It came up, it came to him and it hurt him and maybe he was tempted as that's what it is. I don't know, but he was stripped and wounded. But praise the Lord, the next part it says, and they departed leaving him half dead. They didn't kill the man. Right. Because if you're one of the lords, the world can, can't touch you. That's it. They can't take everything from you. They can only take what the Lord allows from you. And we see this in Job as well. So they left him and they departed, leaving him half dead, which also tells me that this man's life had a purpose. He hadn't completed what he would put Amen. on earth to do. In the next verse it says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. The priest and the Levites came by, and we're going to talk about this in a second, but it said a certain priest went by. Mm -hmm. A priest, of course, the religious leaders of that of that time and that day, he came by. And it says a certain priest, which could just be because it's a it's an allegory, it's a parable. He wouldn't give a name, or it could be that this this person was ordained to walk this way, right? And yeah. he saw an opportunity that the Lord had given him, and he just walked on by because if he touched a man who was bleeding or he said he was half dead so if the man looked dead and he was unable to tell the difference just walking by he would have to go through this arduous cleaning ritual or right. thing that the Lord the Lord had told them to do but it, it was work and he would have to set himself apart and it was just work and it was just easier for this man instead of helping someone just to keep on going we probably to Jerusalem or Jericho and said he was on his way we don't know but they just said he, he just he walked away. And then the this is likewise a Levite came by, saw the opportunity the Lord had given him to help somebody else and thought, well, no. <laughs> Maybe he thought uh, in, in Christianese, you know, it's easy. So, well, I think so-and-so would be better suited for that. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I, you know, I didn't pass first aid in, in high school. I just, <laughs> it's easy just to walk by. Someone, someone will come by and someone will, will take care of that. Why don't we ask Jonah what, what he thought about that when he said, well, I think, you know, Jonah didn't have any names, but Jonah said, I think maybe someone else would be better to go to Nineveh. Right. But no, the Lord, the Lord has a plan. His plan will be carried out. Amen. And we also see the Levites, that he just, they, they, there was no gain for them to do this because there was no one around. There, no one would see their good works. 
And in verse 33, it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Amen. Here also we see that there was a certain Samaritan that came by. It wasn't just a haphazard person on the road, but it was a certain Samaritan. The Lord had ordained this person to walk on this path. And this, per this person, the Samaritan, went and he had compassion on him. Do we show compassion on those that we see every day? Those that, uh, that we come across at the gas station or in Walmart or wherever it is at work? You know, this is a... I didn't steal this message, I promise, but I heard a very similar message on Friday at Faith. The gentleman talked about um, uh, your uh, uh, spiritual certification, your spiritual first aid responder certification. You know, if you see someone's house on fire, you don't just go, oh, well, their house is on fire. I wonder if they know. <laughs> no, if you see your neighbor's house on fire, you jump up and go, hey, you know, what's going on? Now, he actually jumped. I'm not going to do that this evening, but <laughs> this morning. But, you know, he, he, you jump up and, and you go and you say, hey, 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 can I, what's going on? Where's the garden hose? Let's put this thing out. Let's call right. the garden part. We see the certain Samaritan, or the, the Levite and the, and the priest, they walk by and say, well, his house is on fire. Somebody should probably do something about that. And they just kept right on going. Right. But this certain Samaritan showed he had compassion on him. He showed that, that he saw a need and, and he jumped in and, and wanted to help. In verse 34 it says, And he went to him, the man that was, that was half dead, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and sat him on his own beast and brought him to an inn. And he took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Amen. This man went and he helped the man that he saw. He had compassion on him and he helped him. And we see also that he helped this man and it cost him something. Mm -hmm. It didn't just cost him his money. It cost this man time. Mm -hmm. Now, because uh, he, he stayed the, he stayed a night in an inn with this man. Now, whether or not that was part of the plan, we don't know. But we know he, this man did take the time to spend the night to make sure the man was okay through the night. It cost this man oil and wine, or medicine. You know, oil, oil, like I said, everything. Um, not a lot of money was made back then. Oil and wine weren't just everywhere. You did have to pay for them. Right. It also cost this man something else. And this is more abstract, so hopefully I don't get in trouble for this. But it cost this man his comfort. Mm -hmm. So it said this man, as he journeyed along, um, we took him, and I'm trying to find this place right here. It says he, he sent him, hold on, I'm sorry, I may have just made this part up. But uh, he brought him and took care of him. He sent him on his own beast. I know I didn't make it up, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he sent him on his own beast. Now, assuming probably at this time it wasn't a horse, it was probably a mule or a donkey or something like that. Horses were reserved for war. But he set this man upon it. Now, yeah, I don't know about you. I don't have much experience with half-dead people. But from what I can see from Bonanza uh, or, and uh, other Westerns, when somebody's not feeling well, you, you throw them on and they usually lay sideways. And there's not a lot of room for you for you whenever you're right. carrying somebody like that. And so this man probably had to walk the rest of the way to the end. He didn't get to ride his, right. his, his animal. It cost this man his comfort to help out somebody. And then when he did, it did cost him money because when he got there, he'd give the man two pence and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll, I'll give you what else you need. Two pence, uh, from what I understand, is two pennies. And two pennies at that time was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it cost this man to help. And so Jesus asked the, the, the lawyer, he said, Which of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Amen. And he said, He that had mercy on him. And Jesus said unto him, Go thou and do likewise. Mm -hmm. So the question here this morning is, How do we go and do likewise? In verse 27, where it was back to verse 25, it said, When he tempted the man, he asked, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, you know, points to the Bible, how, what is written in the law, and the man answered, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. So this got me to, to thinking uh, about the passage in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, if you would turn with me there. 
Matthew chapter 22. 22, uh, verse 35. Now here's another uh, another passage where we see Jesus encountered another lawyer. From everything that I can tell, this is a different lawyer, not the same one. It's not a different account, as you see sometimes in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the Gospels. But it says, and, and one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, saying, or said, excuse me, asked him a question, tempted him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Jesus bowled down a lot of things right here. Amen. He bowled it down to two very simple, very pithy, very, very concise statements. The first and great commandment is that you love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. And the second is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I used to work for Chick-fil-A. That's a big part of, if you know me, that's kind of my thing. I used to be the Chick-fil-A guy. And with Chick-fil-A, they have a certain, and it's not exclusive to Chick-fil-A. It's catching on in a lot of everywhere right now. But at that time when I was working for Chick-fil-A, it was the only place I had ever heard but it's something called servant leadership. And so what that means is, is most organizations have a, have a pyramid and you have workers at the bottom and then as the tier gets littler, you have managers, 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 so you get to the top and you get owner or CEO. A servant leadership turns it upside down. It's an upside down pyramid. So you have CEO, leader at the bottom, it goes all the way to the top, your base layer, which is everyone, your, your workers. Mm -hmm. And it's built on the idea of Jesus. And whenever he washed the disciples' feet, Amen. he, Jesus, who, if we look at the pyramid of the church, is at the top of it, right? And um, he, he washes disciples' feet at the bottom. And so it says here that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, whether you want to or not, in your pyramid of your life, on who's important and who's not important, at the very tippy top is you. Because as humans, that's how we're geared to think. Amen. It's number right. one. We want to be the best. We want to be first. We want to be the guy. And everyone else just kind of falls out at the at the bottom, right? And so it, the idea of servant leadership is you put yourself at the bottom and you serve everybody else. Because you take care of everyone else. They'll, you know, in, in, in business, they'll take care of you. But in the Bible, if you take care of everyone else and you treat your neighbor as yourself, then God will take care of you. Jesus, God, the Bible Amen. says, take no care for your raiment or what you're going to eat tomorrow, or what you're going to do tomorrow. You just only think about here and now and do what the Bible says. Life, in a lot of ways, you know, we think and we plan, and but we, you know, we, the Bible says we need to wait and, and say, if the Lord allows, I'll do this tomorrow. Right. But uh, I recently heard this quote, and I haven't been able to get away from it. But uh, as people, we want to plan. We want the Lord to lay it out and sit down with you once a week and say, all right, Bryce, here's, this is what we're doing this week, and that's going to lead into what we're doing next week, and here's the, here's the life, here's your life's plan. But if the Lord doesn't do that, the Lord gives you the next thing you're supposed to do. The Lord's not interested, and in, in, the Lord knows what you're going to be doing. The Lord knows the long plan, but we don't know because we can't. Amen. We're called to just do the next right thing. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have everything planned out for six or seven months, two or three days, none of that. You just have to do when the Lord says, do the next right thing. Mm -hmm. When you're in Walmart shopping and and you see somebody and you think, well, maybe I, maybe you know they're off by themselves. Maybe well, I'm going to talk to that person about Jesus. And you're like, well, I'm in a rush today. If I don't get this done, then I'm going to be late to this other thing. And you know, we just think too much, too far ahead. And, and what we should be doing is, hey, you know. Holy Spirit said, I need to go talk to this person. So in that moment, the next right thing for you to do is to go and talk to that person and be neighborly to that person. Amen. Just because you don't know about that person, that person, that person's house could be on fire, so to speak, in a spiritual sense. They could be lost. You don't know that. So why don't we go over and, and tell them their house is on fire? Why don't we go and tell them, hey, you know, 
Are you saved? Are you lost? Where do you go to church yet? Can I give you a track where you can I invite you to my church? We're going to eat afterwards if that helps. <laughs> we, uh, we, we're called to be neighborly and we're to, to love that person as ourselves. Because let me tell you something, I don't know about you, but when I was lost, I wanted people to pray for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it really because, you know, I wasn't saved. And, you, you know, we kind of, and when we're lost, we don't want people to do it because it's annoying. And it's pointing out something that's wrong with us. And none of us like to be pointed out when we got something wrong with us. Right. But the neighborly thing to do is, is go to them and say, hey, how's your spiritual life? Mm -hmm. That's the neighborly thing to do. In the Bible, thou shalt love thy neighbor is used seven times in the New Testament. That specific phrase. Now, that sentiment is echoed throughout all of the Bible mm -hmm. in different ways. But the specific phrase, thou shalt love thy neighbor, is used seven times. Mm -hmm. And in Matthew, where we just read, it, it says, um, thou shalt love the Lord with all thy God. And it also says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Both of these words, love, are the same word in in the Greek. And I believe, if I, I, it's been a while since I looked at it, but the Greeks had, I believe it was seven different words for love. That they didn't, you know, in English, you either like somebody or you love somebody or you hate somebody. Right, I mean, that, that's it. There's not a lot of in between. But the Greeks had different kinds of love and they had different words. Mm -hmm. So they had a family love. They had a, um, you know, hey, I, I like, you know, you're my brother kind of love at work, a camaraderie of sorts. And then they had um, just, just, like I said, just different kinds of love. But the, the pinnacle of their love was called agape love. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of love that we see here in both love the, the thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's, a, it's an agape love, mm -hmm. which is the most pure form of love. It's the kind of love that God has for us and why he sent his son to die on the cross. For Amen. Us. So then the question is, now how do we, how do we love our neighbor? And I got really scared when the brother turned to 1 John chapter 4 because that's where I'm going right now. Uh, his, his Sunday school lesson, praise the Lord, dovetails quite nicely into to what, I, what I have today. I got really scared with the Matthew and John and everywhere that I'm going. So, you know, the Lord works that out. But he said 1 John 4, and I thought, I've never had this happen before. <laughs> but 1 John chapter 4, we're going to go down a little further than he was in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Amen. It was in this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Mm -hmm. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Mm -hmm. Here we see the Bible is telling us that God loves you and you need to love your neighbor. And Loving your neighbor means... Going to them and telling them that their house is on fire. Going to them and having that difficult conversation of, hey, I think you're lost. Or, I'm sorry, are you lost? You don't know if someone's lost, you know. I uh, heard an old, an old preacher, Brother John, he, he always asked the question, he said, how many people know you're saved? And you get to thinking, the town, oh, there's my family, the people I go to church with. And I told that guy at Walmart. And, you know, you come up with a number and he says, no, only two people. Only you and God know if you're saved. That's it. That's it. Amen. The other day at the church, we have some theater seats in the wings. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. They're closed off by curtains if you don't know what I'm talking about. But this in the back in the day, the church was so big, they built wings and had people literally in the wings, and they got theater seats to pull mm -hmm. to fill them. Now, that was back in the 60s and 50s, so it hadn't been like that since Dad's been there. <clears throat> but uh, not nothing against him, of course. Uh, but uh, he hadn't let me preach Sunday morning, though, so I don't know. But <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, we're, you know, we don't need them anymore, and we have some other projects we're working on, so we were selling these, these chairs, and um, this, this guy came, he wanted to buy some, and so I was there unscrewing them, and he got there, and we got to talk, and he was going to put them in his church in a Sunday school room. He wanted to have something for the, the kids to sit in, so we got to talking, and he was, uh, I forget, I think he was Southern Baptist, I can't remember all the specifics, but it was somewhere 
you know, down the road from us. And um, he got to asking what we believe versus what they believe. And of course, you know, he asked me what we believed that was different. Of course, the first thing that went to my mind was, well, probably predestination and election. That is usually <laughs> the big one, you know, when you get across right. somebody. And of course, I told him, you know, well, you know, we believe in a couple things. And then I was like, yeah, I got the predestination. And I was like, you know, we believe in predestination. He's like, oh, he said, well, he said, we don't sell that at my church. <laughs> I promise you, uh, hand on the Bible, that's what he said. He, his phrase, he said, we don't sell that. <laughs> and so he got to explain what they believe. And what they believe is predestination. They just are so scared of the word to use it because it turns people off. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, well, brother, he said, well, why do you use that word? He said, if you use predestination, you know, if the God already knows who's going to be saved, then why do we go out and, and minister to people? Why do we go out and hand out tracts and this and that? He said, that's, that's why we don't sell predestination. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, first of all, it's in the Bible. <laughs> that's the big one. And second of all, you don't know. <laughs> the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. And just because God knows everyone that's going to be saved, you don't. Right. And God works through man because he put us here. God works through us and he works through you. If you had been left alone all by yourself as an island, would you have ever come to Jesus? Would you have ever come to know him? Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Because there's no, you wouldn't have known about it. If, if, you, if, you find, if you find some people on an island out in the Caribbean or Pacific or just some island that no one's ever heard of, and you go to them and you'd be like, do you believe in gravity? No. First of all, they don't know what that is. Second of all, they've never heard of it. And why would they believe in it? They may believe in what they can see when they throw a rock in the air or they shoot a bow and arrow, it comes to the ground. But they don't know why. It's just that's what happens. Right. And if you have somebody all by themselves and they've never talked to anybody and they live on an island, they don't know God. Amen. They don't know, they don't know Jesus. They don't know how to be saved. But they know that the grass is green and the sky is blue and there's fish in the sea. So they can see the effects of God, but it, just like the Ethiopian man, if, 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 how could I know unless somebody tells me? So when this man says he doesn't sell predestination, he just, you know, that'll just work itself out, so to speak. It, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come to it if, if they're called. Well, how come, they, how come they can't know of it because of us? Mm -hmm. How come it can't be because I handed them a track in Walmart or at the gas station? I know those are my two examples. That's where you see most of my people. <laughs> well, most where I see most people. You know, when you hand them a track and you say, hey, here's, here's this. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. it. Maybe that's the first time I've ever seen a track. In church, we have the Spanish mm -hmm. ministry. And the other day, Brother Enrique, we were in a, they were in a bunkhouse. And there were, I think there was three or five guys. I, I don't remember what they said. But Brother Enrique went around and asked them. He said, hey. How many of you have one of these? And no, no, no one raised their hands. Brother Rick, he said, how many of you have ever owned one of these? You know, in Mexico, no one raised their hand. How many of you have ever read the Bible? None of them raised their hand. These are men that live just, you know, south of the border. Right. They're not, you know, Mexico is not as bad as some places. It's not like the Bible's not been translated into language. It's not like they're in a religionless place. Everyone down there claims to be something Catholic, Pentecostal. Very few of them are Baptists. But these people, have, and if you ask them, do you believe in God? Yes, yes, yes. Did you go to church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever owned a Bible? No. And how do we know what the, what the, what the Bible or what the God has for us? Or how do we know if, if we, no one tells us? Just like the Ethiopian eunuch, yeah, how can I know unless someone shows me? And that's why we go out and we, and we hand out tracts and we, we witness to people and, and we show people what the Bible says. Because predestination doesn't mean that we can't do that. Now, that was, I'm sorry, that was kind of a, a side a sidetrack there, but it, it fits in with, with being neighbor. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, when, you, when you're lost and you know someone that's lost, you want to tell them you want them to be saved because the alternative is a life in hell. That's it. And, and that's a terrible place predominantly because it's the absence of God. Mm -hmm. the, the, the worst part about hell isn't the fire or the worms or the devil or the torments. It's the fact that God's not there. That hell and the lake of fire is the absence of God. That's it. Something we cannot fathom because we are surrounded by God. 
So when you see someone and you see them and you see their house is on fire, <laughs> I'm going to keep stealing that, you need to tell them. And you need to bring the water and hose of the gospel over and spray them down and make sure they know. First John here says that God is love. Mm -hmm. God is love. Do you love your neighbor? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. I've got some neighbors I don't particularly enjoy in my life. They cause me a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble, and I just despise them. It's hard to look at them. <laughs> it is. But the Bible says we're to love them and to manifest the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be nice to everybody all the time because mm -hmm. we're just people. And we get frustrated and we we get hateful. You know, we just get upset with ourselves and then that carries over to who we're talking to. And it's easy whenever that one person who you just you just you know, I say they just have a face. You know, it just that's their whole problem is they just have a face and they just get on your nerve just by being there. And when you're having a bad day and that person comes along, it's easy just to say something, isn't it? <laughs> to do something. But that's not what the Bible says. And this is, you know, this is one of those things where, it, it, as cliche as it is, you know, I'm not really pointing fingers right now, but if you point a finger, you've got three of them pointing back to you. Mm -hmm. This is just as much for me as it, as it is for y'all, and this isn't pointed at anybody. In case you've got something going on, don't come after me afterward and go, how'd you know? <laughs> it's because you're human. i got a pretty good idea. <laughs> But herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. We can't love God on our own. We have no reason to. All on, uh, by ourselves, left to ourselves, you don't love God because you can't. Right. But the Bible points out God. It points out what God has for us. And it shows us the love of God. And we love God because he first loved us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Turn with me now to Romans, Romans chapter 13. Bear with me, I still have a new Bible. I had a very small Bible when I turned to be, when I started to preach, I had to give me a preacher Bible, so uh, it's still kind of new. But Romans 13 and, and verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Amen. Now we can stop right there. We're going to keep going. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, if there be any other commandment. It is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Amen. If you love your neighbor, you don't kill him. If you love your neighbor, you don't steal from him. If you love your neighbor, you don't covet after your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you don't lie about your neighbor. And keep in mind when you say neighbor, it's not just the guy that lives on the left and right and across the road from you. It's everyone that you see and everybody that you come in contact with. Because being a neighbor doesn't just mean it's who you live beside. Or it's not just those in this building who believe the same as you. Being neighborly and having neighbors is everybody that you come across in this world. That's who your neighbor is. Mm -hmm. And it says here, that love worketh no ill to his neighbor, and therefore love is fulfilling, is the fulfilling of the law. Mm -hmm. If you love your neighbor, you want the best for them. And if you truly love somebody, you want to be at your best for that person. Because if you're not at your best, then it means there's more that you could do for that person. And maybe that, you know, in a spiritual application, that means if you don't read the Bible and you don't know what's in the Bible, then you can't help somebody that's going through something. Right. Recently, I, I talked to a gentleman, and um, he has a lot going on. I'm not going to say it, but he just has a, he has a lot going on, both 
emotionally and physically, and he had lost his job and was living out of his car, hmm. and he just he was in a rough shape. Hmm. And so um, I didn't I, I find you know I won't say found him, but I I was the one that made contact. It was somebody else, but you know they told me, and so I you know I went and helped out. But um, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to, but nonetheless. While we were talking, I, we, we were talking one Sunday, and I, we had, gave a short lesson there on Sunday, and and it was just me and him at this time. It was someone who speaks Spanish, so I was doing my best with what I had. And uh, um, at the end, you know, he was trying to he was trying to tell me everything that happened to him. Um, he had he had he had gotten uh, mixed. Uh, he had a girlfriend, and they broke up, but then she sent people to beat him up and. And the Pentecostals were calling him and saying that demons were after him and witches were after him. And he just had a lot going on. <laughs> and um, I told him, uh, I just pointed him to the Bible. I said, Romans, Romans, um, oh my goodness, 8, 28, 3, 28. I'm blanking out on what it says. Don't hold it against me. But it says, God works all things to good for them that love him. And I told him, I said, brother, I can't tell you everything's going to be okay right now. Mm-hmm. It, it's gonna it's gonna be a real bummer probably for a while. Right. Okay. It, it takes a lot to get over these sorts of things. I said, but I know, and I can tell you with assurance that it will get better because that's what the Bible tells me. Mm-hmm. And I said, brother, you're here right now, and you're here in church, and, and you're receptive. He had his own Bible already, which is not something very common with with the people in the people in the Hispanic ministry. I, but he he read the Bible. And after that, you know, that was in Clarksville. We went to my church at Julian because there was a, a service that night in Spanish by someone from Mexico, praise the Lord, so I didn't have to preach again. But uh, during that interim, you know, he kind of went off on his own and was reading the Bible on his own. And, and the man had a desire. The man wanted to know what was right. And he had a religious organization chasing after him going, hey, brother, you're, you know, I don't know what, exactly everything they were telling him, but I do know that they were saying that demons and witches were after him. Now, I couldn't tell you why or how, the, why that is. But the Pentecostals were after him telling him all these things. And the man was confused. And so I just pointed him to the Bible and I said, listen, this is what the Bible says, brother. Mm-hmm. Amen. It, it, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. But the Lord will take care of it. Amen. And I'm saying this not because I'm trying to brag. I, I promise I really wasn't trying to until afterwards I realized that it could be conceived that way. So please don't hold it against me when I said that. But the man, the man needed help. The man's house was on fire. Mm-hmm. Amen. And we tried our best to hose him down with the gospel. Amen. <laughs> and put it out and show him the Bible. And, and, and the man is doing better now, not because of me, but he's been staying with the, mix, the Mexican pastor. And he's been talking with him a lot. And he's been in the Bible a lot. And, and the man is getting over it to some small degree, his depression. And he has a job now. And he's Amen. moving forward. Praise the Lord. And now the Pentecostal church is calling the pastor going, Brother, the Lord's going to bless you so much for what you're doing. Just <laughs> so much, dear, you know. And, and so the pastor, of course, is kind of writing them off. But to, to these people, it's, it's all works. It's all works. Yep. But it's not about works. The Bible says it's not, not, not by works, lest any man should boast. We don't be neighborly for the sole sake of going up to someone at church on Sunday and going, I guess what I did this week. <laughs> I gave $20 to that guy at Walmart. <laughs> no, no, no. We be neighborly because you're showing the love of God. Right. And the love of God, because we see in another passage of 1 Corinthians, says love both just not. Love doesn't, you don't tell everyone what you do when you love somebody. You do it just because you love them, not for the accolades of him. Amen. Turn with me now if you go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 12 says, now let's start with verse, uh, this is in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Amen. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. And we're going to go down to verse 23. It says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto man, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. Amen. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called to one body, and be thankful. When you love somebody, you want the best for them. And when you love somebody, it says here, is, is charity is the bond of perfectness. When you love somebody, you put their needs above your own, physically and spiritually, and sometimes even emotionally, mm -hmm. which is a hard one for us to do. Mm -hmm. But when you love somebody, you want the best things for them. And what better thing can we give somebody than the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. You know, I heard a story a long time ago. I don't know if it's true or not. I, heard, I think I was in school at the time, so there's a possibility it was a story I read. Um, but it was a guy, and his ministry, if you will, he would just ride airplanes, you know, back and forth all the time. And he would sit beside these businessmen, and they would get to talking about business. And the man would get to talking about, he's oh, man, you should hear, hear my retirement policy. As he said, man, when I retire, I get a big mansion. In a gated community, it's the roads gonna look gonna be gold. Of course, all these businessmen want to know what company he worked for, and he said, Well, he said, Let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> he said, When I retire, when I die, when I'm finally no longer able to do anything for the Lord, I'm gonna be dead. Mm -hmm. He said, When I die, I'm gonna go to my eternal reward in heaven. Amen. But he said it's gonna be a gate, not we always, we always say pearly gates, and all the pictures you see, it's a bunch of pearls. It looks real pretty, but that's not what it is. It says gates of pearl. It's going to be one pearl. There's not going to be a bunch of ridges like a pearl necklace. It's one solid pearl. He said, you got pearl gates, and I'm going to walk on gold so pure it's translucent. It's see-through. And the foundations are going to be of 12 different types of stone, some I've never heard of and can't hardly pronounce. Mm -hmm. And if you love somebody, wouldn't you want them to work for you, <laughs> so to speak? If, if you love somebody and you want the best for them, wouldn't you want them to have that instead of the opposite of that, the absence of God? Because that's a, it's a, the amazing thing about heaven is it is the continual presence of God, while hell is the complete absence of God. Right. You won't have to go to church in heaven because it is church in a way, to, so to speak. You will constantly be with the Lord and be with Jesus, and you will praise them both continually. And you'll have a mansion. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know. It says we'll be praising the Lord for all, you know, for the rest of our life, for all of eternity. Amen. But when you love somebody, you tell them their house is on fire, and you tell them that they're lost and that they need the Savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because the alternative is worse than our limit. <laughs> to use that analogy. The, 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 the opposite is, is a worm that never dies. A continual fire in the absence of God and the presence of the devil. Mm -hmm. So as you go about your life and you go about your week this week, just, just think on these things. And and. Remember what, what, what Jesus said at the, in Luke at the very end of that. When he asked the man, he said, Which of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves and, or the world? That fell among the world. That the world came and, and, and stripped him and beat him and wounded him and left him half dead. Right. And when you go about your, your, your life and your week this week and you see those around you and you think, I wonder if they're half dead. Who's been beaten on this person this week? What has, been, what has this person been robbed of this week? It doesn't have to be anything profound. Mm -hmm. This man here that we see that was left half dead, an analogy, he could be saved, he could be lost. In the analogy, it doesn't matter. 
The point is that he had been chewed up and spat out by the world. He had been in a rough time. He had been in a hard time. And all he needed was someone to show just a little compassion. Right. All he needed was someone to show him the way and to help him out. And you know, that man, it never says anything else about the man once they get to the, the inn. But that man could have woke up the next day after that, the Samaritan had gone and never known his name. We, I mean, it's a parable, so he doesn't have a name, but he, never, he may never know it. And that Samaritan, by the time he made it back to that inn, however long it was, that man could have already been up and gone. And they may have never seen each other again, and neither one truly known what the other one who, who they are or what they did. The, the one man not know what the other one did. The other man not know what the other man did. But the man lived. Mm -hmm. And Amen. the man went out and the man was able to tell that story, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he said, you know, somebody help me. I don't know their names. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Maybe as that man was going along, one day he's going to see someone on the side of the road and they're going to be half dead. The world's going to chew them up and spat them out. He's going to help that person. Right. And the Samaritan will never know what about that other guy. You may be the only Bible that someone ever sees. Mm -hmm. See that. Maybe sometimes what you're called to do is to brace, you know, to fix somebody up, put them up in a hotel room and and all that. Maybe maybe it's just to hand them a track. Maybe it's just to smile to that person in Walmart who's just having a rough day and they don't really need you to talk to them because they don't need they don't want to be talked to. They just need you to walk by and say, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, as you're grabbing the tomato sauce. Maybe, maybe that's all you're called to do. Maybe your calling and how you're gonna help everyone is just being at church and letting the pastor know that you support them. Maybe, I can't tell you what your purpose is. That's, that's not for me to know. And the Lord's not going to tell me what your purpose is. The Lord will tell you what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. As long as you talk, and he'll tell you what your purpose is, whether you want to or not. It's whether or not you listen. You need, you need to be in prayer, and we need to be in the Bible to find out what our purpose is. You know, the Bible says we're not all hands, we're not all feet, we're not all eyes. Because if we all were, then how would we do the rest of the things? In the church, not everyone does the same thing. Mm -hmm. But when Jesus asked who was the one that was neighborly, the, the man says that it was the one that showed mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go thou and do likewise. Amen. So this week and for our lives as Christians and as those that are saved, we are to go and do likewise and be neighborly to those who we come across. Mm -hmm. Whether you like them or not. We have, I'm sure we've all had bad neighbors at one point or another. And you're going to run across some spiritually bad neighbors. Those people who don't believe in predestination and you say, well, the Lord will take care of it. Well, so-and-so is better. You know, so-and-so would be better at this than I would be. You know, I don't, I, I'm not, I can't right now. I'm busy. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help. But the Bible says, go thou and do likewise, and we're called to be neighbor. So as you go this week and in your life, this, this, this lesson doesn't have a week expiration date on it, you know. Yeah. And it's not because of what I'm telling you. It's not because of, of how eloquent it was that I presented. I'm sure when I want, you know, if you watch the video, you'll think, man, that guy stuttered a lot. <laughs> it's not because of me. It's not because of Uncle Larry, Brother Larry. It's not because of, of any pastor when you hear a message. That's not why it's important. It's important because of the Bible. Amen. It's important because of what we teach in the Bible. This evening in Spanish, the, the lesson is is just that because a lot of them in there have influence from the Catholic Church, the Pentecostal Church, and now they're in a Baptist Church, and you know just they don't they don't they're just so mixed up because none of them have ever owned and they've never read a Bible. Mm -hmm. And the message is it doesn't matter what the Catholics say, it doesn't matter what the Pentecostals say, it doesn't matter what the Baptists say. What matters is what the Bible says, yeah, what the Bible teaches. When Paul preached to those people, and I, I continuously forget their names and I apologize, but when he preached to them, they said, we'll get back with you tomorrow. <laughs> and they went home and they studied and they redid all the sermons that Paul teached. And they come back the next day and they said, that was right. What you said was right. Hmm. Do it again. Right. And when he got done preaching that one, they said, we'll get back with you tomorrow. And they went home and they studied. And they said, brother, what you're saying is right. Yep. And when you leave here today, don't take my word for it. Just because I got up here on this, on this pool, in the pulpit on the platform and, and, and had a suit coat on. That doesn't mean that I know what I'm talking about. 
What matters is what the Bible says. Amen. Don't take my word for it. You're not going to offend me if you call me up and you go, brother, you misquoted this. Or, hey, brother, I don't know what you mean. I think you were wrong here because it's not what I say. It's what the Bible says. Amen. It doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't matter how it's always been. It doesn't matter what so-and-so is doing at this church or what so-and-so is doing at that church. What matters is what the Bible says. Amen. And the Bible is the inspired word of God. The word inspired in the original Greek it's a big long name. I'm not going to, I don't remember it exactly, but it translates directly into English. It's transliteration instead of translated. Means God breathed. Amen. Meaning every word in the Bible was inspired by God. The big fancy word for that is verbal plenary inspiration. Okay, that's your 10 cent word for the day. Verbal plenary inspiration. Every word, every jot, every tittle, every, every a, an, and the is what the Lord ordained to be in the Bible. Amen. And that's the only thing that matters is what's in the Bible. And when the Lord shows you what's in the Bible, it is your revelation. It is the truth from God. Amen. And so praise the Lord that we have this. And that's another rabbit trail that I went on to. I'm getting good at those. But what the Bible says is important. And what the Bible is telling me and what I believe that the Bible is telling me is to go out every day and every moment to be neighborly and to do the next right thing and to tell those people who are lost that they're lost and this is the way. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You can do nothing to earn your salvation. You can do nothing for salvation. You can do nothing at all. That's it. Because when you go to heaven without the blood of Jesus, when you if, if you when you go to the, the judgment without Jesus, you're standing before him in dirty clothes and filthy rags, the Bible says. And if you go up to him and you say, Well, I've done this good and that good and this good and that good. Jesus looks at that and says, that is nothing. Right. It's like going and trying to buy a Ferrari and offering the salesman a dollar. It's just insulted that you even offered anything. Mm -hmm. It would have been better that you didn't offer anything at all. Because if you're going to walk out there without a Ferrari, whether you gave a dollar or not. And when you go to heaven and you say, here's all of my good works. Jesus says, that is nothing. All right. But when you are saved, you are washed with the blood of Jesus Christ and you are given a white robe. And when you go and you stand before the judgment and, 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 you, and you die, Jesus will stand there and he will say, I paid for this man's sin so he didn't have to. Right. See the prince. See the spear. Mm -hmm. See the crown of thorns. I took this man's punishment so that he would not have to. Praise the Lord. Amen. Jesus went to... And, 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 and died on the cross for our sins so that we would not have to eternally be dead. The second death mm -hmm. is, what, is what hell is called in Revelations. Mm -hmm. Hell is you die twice. And when you get to heaven, you haven't died at all. Amen. Because this physical body, the corporeal, it is, it is nothing. It's just a bag of Blood and bones and some muscle and ligaments hold it all together. But what is important is your eternal soul. And your soul is important, and your soul is important, and your soul is important. And everyone that you come across in Walmart, the gas station, and work in, if you go more places than I do, I'm sorry, the ball game, I don't know. But when you're out in these places, every person you see, their soul is important, and their soul has intrinsic value just because of who they are. Mm -hmm. Because we believe in God and we are created in man's image. And when you look in the Bible and it talks about murder in, in, in Genesis, the crime isn't that you killed somebody, it's that you killed the image of God. Because they, they are made in the image of God and we have a soul and that soul is valuable and everyone's soul is valuable. And if you don't believe in predestination and you just go, well, they're going to come to it if they will and if they don't, it's not my problem. Then how will they ever know? You may be the only Bible somebody sees, so that means you must live your life as though that is the case, as though they are the only Bible you'll ever see. And I'm guilty of that. That people look at me and they go, well, I don't know. You know, I always think about this. I heard this a long time ago. It's nothing groundbreaking. But 
If you were to be put on trial to be a Christian, could you be convicted? Right. <laughs> could they convict you of reading your Bible or praying or helping out everyone or loving your neighbor? Could you be convicted? Or would the jury go out and be like, well, yeah, there's, some, there's some reasonable doubt here that he may not be a Christian. I'm worried that sometimes if you were to put me in, in, on, on trial that there might be some reasonable doubt. That I might get off scot-free of you know, being able to be convicted of a Christian, to be saved, of a saved individual. So when you go out and you see somebody, you don't know whether their house is on fire or not. It's not for you to know. And you may talk to that person and they may not be saved for another 10 years. They may not be saved till you walk away. They may never be saved. But we're not called to keep count. We're not called to have a, to have a hash mark at the house like, I'll talk to this person, this person. We're called to be neighborly. And when you love somebody, you don't keep track of everything that you do for them. I've heard of people who keep books of their children. I spent this much money on diapers. I spent this much money on food. I spent this much money. And whenever the child gets old, they go, here's your bill. <laughs> I like cash. When you love somebody, you don't do that. Right. I'm not a parent, so I can't completely say this, but I have a pretty good idea that I won't do that. <laughs> And I have a pretty good idea the parents are here, you, you, you know, you don't have a list, you know, itemized list. You may have a, you know, up here you may not forget, but if you don't have a list, then you know, you're not, you're not charging them for that. You don't hold it over their heads. And just because someone's lost doesn't mean you need to hold it over their head. It means you need to have love, you need to have compassion. You need to give them oil and wine. You need to give them medicine. You may have to spend money. You may have to uh, give up some comfort. It may be awkward to go and talk to them. But we're called to be neighborly and to do what we are called to do. It may not always be easy. The Lord never promised it'd be easy, but he did promise it would be more than you could bear. In that, go and do likewise, the Lord said. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Be neighborly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen.